morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos días. ¿Cómo están? How are you? Good morning. It seems like people are still waking up and still getting here this morning. Um, but thank you for those of you who were here before 10 o'clock, for those of you who are uh, with us with a lot of energy. My name is Graciela Sanchez, and in a few minutes we'll go around and ask all of you to uh, introduce yourselves. I'm in this very strange position because we are being filmed by a now cast. Um, is there any, oh, someone else from media, is that uh, you right. over there? Rebarb report is here. You're Rocio? Si. Si. Hola. Yeah, Rocio. Okay, so anybody else from press? I'm not reporting this. Okay. 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 So um, on behalf of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, on behalf of the Buena Gente of San Antonio, which is everyone around the circle, I hope, <laughs> uh, we welcome you to it, what is just the continuation of many conversations by the community to try to resolve the problems that we face daily, um, especially, I mean, it's the, the title of today is Take Back the City, Take Back Our San Antonio. Esperanza is almost 30 years old, and during that time frame, we have found ourselves always resisting a lot of new policies and, and development in the city that comes from somewhere else, but it doesn't seem to be something that the community has asked for. And, and try as we may to resist uh, as we educate each other about what the issues are, if it's about Vista Ridge pipeline coming in, costing $3.4 billion, if it's about all this decade of downtown where the town town, you know, as some of us remember, was the downtown for everyone. That we shopped there, that we played there, that it was our it was ours, right? And now it seems like if you read today's paper, it's gonna be for the techies only or for the folks that are wealthy enough to live in in, in town homes or efficiencies that started a thousand dollars for four or five hundred square feet. That's not my family, that's not me personally, and I know it's not anyone here as well. But that development and all those changes are taking place, and who's making those decisions? Esperanza, as I mentioned, has been part of the work. You know, we come from the history of many, 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 many people before us. We don't come to our consciousness if not for the fact that our abuelas and our bisabuelas taught us that and also resisted. And so we're, you know, continuing to be present, to be, to say, you know, you can't do this to us, we, you know, this is our home. This has always been our home for hundreds if not thousands of years. Um, Gianna will explain part of our timeline and power map and possible futures next steps in a bit after we, um, again, introduce ourselves. But just remember, I mean, I, the last couple of issues in La Voz, and we don't have any, we have some right here and some downstairs, but a couple of months ago, it was all about Brackenridge, and, you know, it was just a email that Maria Periosaba sent to some folks, and suddenly it's, an, you know, there's several articles in La Voz, and people respond because they're not, we're not happy about what's happening in Brackenridge Park. Um, the next issue incorporates concerns about the Alazana Apache courts. We saw what happened with Victoria courts, what, 15, 20 years ago. The folks, what was then known as an Anglo, uh, low income housing that was built in the 40s, then becomes uh, more brown and black as time goes on, is the first of the historical public housing uh, entities in the city that goes down and now it's Hemisview and it's you know if 10% of the people that live there are low income or affordable housing that's about all so what happened to those other 90% of the community where did they get displaced to and then we saw just recently uh, Victoria I mean Wheatley courts and so we know that the Alas and Apache courts are next 
And so they, the, the San Antonio Housing Authority did apply and fortunately did not get the choice grant that they did get for the weekly courts. But part of our resistance is to do community consciousness raising, education, you know, and, and to love ourselves for being working class, for being whatever we are, you know, the diversity that we are, but people ultimately who work for justice, people who ultimately work for class and justicia. So I think I'll just end there. And again, it didn't start in May around Grafton Ridge or talking about Alessandra Apache Courts. You know, we talked about the public space. In 2007, we saw our access to the streets denied because in 2006, tens of thousands of immigrants and, and migrants and supporters of, you know, of our migrant immigrant community said no to the policies in 2006. And so we never seen so many people march. But within months, the city said, no, we don't want you all to march on the street. And suddenly we saw downtown Main Plaza disappear and go to Main Plaza Conservancy. And then suddenly we couldn't access the plaza like we used to. And Travis Park. So it's all just a continuation. Neoliberalist policies in this country. So let us know that today is not the beginning and it's not the end. We hope that this continues on because we need to work together for the solutions and together we, we, we win. <coughs> Separated will fall apart because it's too much for any one person or when any one organization to do this work. So Jana, do you want to just have everybody introduce themselves? Should I just? Yeah. So, okay, Barbara, do you want to? Uh, uh, Barbara Whithell, uh, River Road Neighborhood, and uh, the uh, Joint City County Commission on Elderly Affairs. And yeah, and just like Barbara, just kind of keep it short so that way we can go through and really get to the important, not that you and who you are is important. <laughs> yeah. But just let's narrow that. Betty Edgar, also Department of Affairs Neighborhood. And they brought the station. I couldn't make an alliance. And when I had to do it, I was coming down there. Well, I'm going to go to the city hall and coming down there. I'm going to go to the city hall.
decided that uh, he's going to, well, actually, we got a ride, but we can prove it. But in any case, um, it was demolished in 2002. The Esperanza was one of the groups that joined forces. And I have to tell you, it's been very disappointing to me to see how the process has been so degraded. We lost the case, obviously, but at least there was a process. And now, with the degradation of our rights, you can't even speak up anymore. They cut you off because you can open your mouth. So uh, the media, too, has been very lax in, in um, <coughs> really telling the, the full story. So uh, that's really something very concerning to me um, because you can't even start the fight. They, they cut it off before you even open your mouth. Here we go. Thank you. Denise Stalkup um, from Westport, a little three and a half street neighborhood about a half mile north of the Pearl. Chuck Stalkup with her. My name is Amelia Valdez and I'm a Buena Gente staff here at Esperanza. I reside near Upper Laredo, seen near the Casiano Park, which is one of the oldest park and has not been touched as far as uh, it getting better at all. Just had a linear trail opening and ceremony over there, and we won't be really a part of us talking about the ceremony, but um, yeah. So I'm, I'm involved in that, and I'm first here at this time. So. My name is Natalie Rodriguez, and I'm an intern here at Desmond. My name is Lauren Ferris, and I live in Tobin Hill. Mm -hmm. My name is Jan Olson, and I'm on the board of the Esperanza. Uh, my name is Eduardo Juarez. I'm a civil rights attorney for the federal government. Uh, I'm born and raised on the west side in uh, Prospect Hill. Uh, uh, I presently am a little niner, but I've always been happy west side in my heart. My name is Rachel McGuire. Uh, I've been a sociology professor for the last two years and in my retirement I'm working hard on the Miagua Viva Coalition and water issues in San Francisco. Jim Spicker, my main interests are homelessness and affordable housing with a side interest in actually having the city pay attention to the data when they make decisions. Hi, my name is Andy Flores. I'm from the Hotel Union uh, Nightclub and right now we're working on something uh, around Hemisphere Park uh, I'm Francesca, I'm an intern with the night here. Um, I'm Ramona Rivera, I uh, work at Kono 1011, the radio station and the community calendar where this was posted on and that's how I actually found out about it. Um, I live in District 5 and I recently fought and won against the city. Um, they were trying to build um, three urban lots 200 feet from my house and the legal size letter had a very small portion in Spanish. Most of my neighbors don't even know what it says. So I did the old fashioned thing and went knocking door to door. I have been gone for 10 years from my neighborhood. I was living in California. I've just been there about a year now, seeing the transformation. I love some of it, some of it I don't. So when I went to my neighbors and I was like, hey, can I do that, come in. So I had like coffee and water in everybody's house, caught up and then got the signatures. What turned out, the applicant pulled the application so we won that battle. They call me the Joan of Arc for my body. I'll take that all day. And I have my son with me, Nathaniel, the Superman fan in the back. It's because of him that I'm doing this, and I haven't helped me research all the time. The taxes that they're going up, going up, going up. I'm like, look, they're seven, they're four, and they're $3,000 a year for them. This is what you're going to have to face in 10 years when you're out of college paying loans. So me and you need to get on this together. So he's here to observe and watch how like-minded people can do things together and hopefully have some more wins on our side. Do you want to start, sir? Yeah, just say your name. I'm actually from Spicewood, which is up the road near Marble Falls. Um, I'm involved with Miagua Mi Vida, uh, Energia Mia, uh, Green Party. Uh, I mean, there's just a whole slew of organizations that I've been involved with here for the last decade plus. I'm an anthropologist, and I'm directly involved with the creation of a new medical school that's supposed to be community-based at the University of Incarnate Word. 
I'm John Butchkowski. I'm interested in various issues, and I'm here to learn about the issues and find out what other people had to say about them. My name is Al Campbell. I uh, came here from New Orleans with Katrina. I just bought a house last year because I just decided after about 14 years that I'm, I'm going to stay here in San Antonio. But I've been involved with a lot of initiatives that deal with poverty and, and the impact of poverty upon people. The Eastside Promise neighborhood, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, $30 million grant through United Way, who manages that grant to help people rise up out of poverty. Um, I live in the Coliseum Willow Park area. I don't know if you know where that is, by the AT&T Center. And I'm buying a house that I bought last year, and my monthly house payment is less than half that that people pay to rent in that same neighborhood. And when we talk about affordable housing and we talk about economic disparities, in my neighborhood, property is being consumed almost as soon as it comes on the market. And it's one of those strange dichotomies in that if you have money and you can buy property and invest, it seems logical to do so. But at the same time, for people who are suffering economically, where if they could pay in rent what I pay for a house note, they could really, you know, add some stability to their lives. The other part of this aspect is I've been involved with uh, poverty issues, is that we continue to teach everybody that the panacea to poverty is getting a good education and getting a good job that pays good money. That is the main reason that poverty exists because we are participating in the economic disparities that exist in our society, society because of our goal of success, and that is having money and having things and being recognized as somebody. My position is when we teach, when we learn how to develop and maintain healthy relationships between and amongst ourselves, and we pass this knowledge, skill, ability, and willingness to do so to our children, issues that we face now, they will face fewer of them because we care about each other. And that's what's missing. Here, here. Good morning. My name is Mike Sanchez. I think of myself as a Bozeman worker, but today I came as an observer. I'm Phyllis Sanchez. I'm here with my husband, Sam, invited by my brother-in-law, Mike. Um, Mike's been very involved, and he invited us, and I came to learn and observe. But my particular interest is in homelessness among people recovering addicts or people with addiction problems or people who have um, uh, committed crimes and paid their dues to society and not get housing because they have records or addiction problems and remain homeless and become in this cycle of crime and addiction and crime and addiction because I have that in my very household and I can't that my my family members cannot seem to find a way out of that cycle and I never thought we would be faced with that I mean my family members grew up in middle-class America and found themselves in circumstances that we can't, they can't get out of because of housing issues. Irasema uh, Cavazos, Domésticas Unidas, and uh, we're neighbors there on the east side. Okay. So, uh, yes, poverty and uh, workers that are not recognized and maintain, maintaining workers in poverty by paying on poverty wages. Problem and housing, of course. Um, all these women that are working real hard and continue to stay in poverty, and it's just a pit that they cannot get out of, and we need to do something about it. So, yes, I'm working towards those goals with domestic Unidas. Hi, my name is Jessica Lopez. Jeremy Cash, I'm also an intern. And we didn't give your name. Yes, we got Rodriguez. Here's some 
Back there? Okay, that's my husband's hand. Oh, cool. Cool. Awesome. So, hi everyone. My name's um, Jana Rendon, um, and I am staff here at Esperanza, and I'm from the west side of San Antonio. And so, what we're going to be doing next is we're going, as you look around, you see we sort of have the beginnings of the timeline. And so, we wanted to focus on the bulk of today of really kind of going back into the history of San Antonio and, and Texas and looking at like how this development and how this corporate takeover of our space and how public spaces have been privatized throughout our history. Um, because oftentimes we hear, oh, well this is new, or like when we, especially around what's happening recently around Brackenridge or if it's around something else, it's like this is new, this is something new, we have to stop it now. And it's like, well, it's been happening. And then also we also wanted to look at the history of uh, resistance and what people have been doing historically to kind of stop it. Because we know that there, that has, whenever there's been oppression, there's also been resistance. Um, so we're going to spend about 15 minutes, or, or, or about, um, we're going to give you all some markers. Um, the purple markers or dark colored marker is going to be what you can remember of something that happened either in Texas, it could even be nationally if it was a an event, if it was a, a person who did something, if it was that you think is sort of related to um, displacement, if it's related to developers and corporations having all this power, um, or, or the red is going to be resistance. So if you can think of an event or a person um, or a movement or something that, that is, was a way to kind of combat like, what's been happening. So we're, we only have a few markers so y'all can share. Um, you can talk, okay, so we can just see here. markers, but, um, but try to keep the red markers at least for resistance so that we can like kind of share. So like Charlotte Ann uh, from Nowcast was here yesterday. She made sure to say, you know, the founding of Nowcast as a way of resistance, and I, we appreciated that, that that's now cast, oh, yes. is filming today, and has been, you know, present at the Breckenridge meetings, and if they hadn't been there, there would have been no recording, because the city itself did not record those proceedings. You know, so I'll make sure I put 1987 Esperanza, created, so things like that when I see night here. So if you all jump up, you have more. We'll spend 15 minutes doing that, and maybe, I don't know, my, later on you can say a little bit about the importance of history.
other stuff that John said, but also we'll have some time that if people want to like really speak to something and really like expand on something, we're also going to do that.
San Antonio, we have put given name, or you can say renamed San Antonio. This was in, by the Spanish in 1697. Then you have the, it continues with the history of colonialism. Um, someone put, you know, imperialism, causes of soldiers, militarism. Um, we're moving on to um, U.S. immigrants, or if I was the U.S. More settlers, more fighting, battle the Alamo. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. 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 I can't hear you. Say sorry. I'm sorry. Say Thank the you. the year, Gianna. Thank say you. the year. Okay. So I put fighting. So U.S. Um, immigrants reached the settlement in San Antonio in 1825. 18. 1825. Oh. <laughs> um, then we put more. This is like the official fighting of the, over the Tejas land. Um, we have Battle Elmo, 1836. 1836. I'm sorry, I don't know why I keep saying that. <laughs> 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 1836. When does this report? 18. 18. 18. 18. Okay. Um, then you have the, the end of the, you have the Republic of Texas somewhere. Sorry, over here. You have the end of the Republic of Texas. It's now part of the Union, United States. Um, then you have the Treaty of the Guadalupe Hidalgo. More people, if anyone wants to speak to that. 1848. 1848. Um, okay, someone added this. Um, 1910, Bishop Shaw early, founded Our Lady of Guadalupe Church and School. And that was in response to uh, the influx of uh, citizens that came in from Mexico because of all the turmoil that was going on in Mexico. So it, they were coming in, they started sell, settling the west side because that's where they could settle. The people that had money, I believe, uh, couldn't settle anywhere else because of segregation. So a lot of it had to do, but that's why they wound up on the west side. What year was that? Uh, in the early 1900s, and the church was uh, established in 1910. Okay. Which church? Already was. And then also it adds 1912, the Guadalupana, sorry, I can't say this. The Guadalupana Society there at the church, what was interesting to me is to find out that it was originally uh, founded with the intention to uh, develop leaders among the women. But they're rarely surviving, but they're still around. <laughs> Um, okay, so 1928, someone added the city of Austin master plan and then the construction of I-35. Um, do I speak to that? Yeah. Sure, but, um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure the year, I think it was the late 20s, but, um, city of Austin, um, this is, uh, I guess one of the early manifestations of, like, institutionalized, um, segregation in the city of Austin. I went to school in Austin, so, um, Heard a lot about this highway and the history behind it, and it's a really big um, dividing line in the city of Austin. You see, the east side uh, was um, kind of left for the Black and Latino communities in um, in Austin. It was very underdeveloped, no, not a lot of economic opportunity on that side of town, um, and everyone, um, every communities of color were forced out of the city and. Um, forced to develop that side on their own. And um, just driving up and down that highway is just a constant reminder. Mm -hmm. And you still see that very heavily today. So then we started to the 1930s. Um, somebody, somebody put the Catholic Worker Movement, and someone also put my family supported in 1936. So if anyone who wrote that wanted to speak to that. Um, in the 30s, there was a depression. Anytime time there's an economic downturn, they turn against the immigrant. You know, they're taking our jobs, and that's why we're in such dire straits. So a lot of families were uprooted and deported. And my family was uprooted and deported, even though my grandmother was a U.S. citizen, my mother a U.S. citizen, but she was married to an undocumented man, my grandmother. So when he was deported, I mean, what's a woman with children going to do? She's going to go with her husband. Or, or we have the situation that exists now with many families being torn apart. So my mother, a U.S. citizen, raised in Mexico, 
refuses to this day to speak a word of English, even though she's a U.S. citizen. Okay? If somebody's talking to her in English, she will ask for an interpreter. <laughs> so that's resistance. Okay? But we do need to see that these things have happened in the past and they're happening now. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, cool. And then, so when I moved, we moved to 1938, where we put two things, the Riverwalk construction begins. Um, I wasn't too sure if it, if it actually began in 1938 or was the idea of, of beginning the construction of the Riverwalk. Well, there's the 1921 flood that's not here, and so part of the vision was for them just to cover it up and Basically, the Conservation Society, the San Antonio Conservation Society, has its roots there, and they saved the river after the 1921 flood. And this is, you know, w WPA money. I don't know if <coughs> hands raised. Um, so Roosevelt putting people back to work. Those monies come in to develop the river walk, and lots of the beautiful bridges that we see up on San Pedro or Roosevelt and places like that, and, and the post office downtown. So. Unlike the Obama use of monies, at least it seems like Roosevelt put a lot of people back to work, and we're still living with that beauty. So. And I had read um, the other day that Jack Jack White, or there was someone who was one one of the managers of a hotel that really lobbied to try to begin the construction of the Riverwalk. So even like back in the days where you, you that it was then the hotels and the big businesses that were like, we need this development. But Emma Tenayuka and, and the pecan shellers and labor and union, CIO is it's basically <coughs> starting up in the country, right? So the AFL, the CIO part of it is, is organizing here. The Communist Party is organizing in San Antonio. And Emma Tenayuka, a 17, 18, 19, 20 something year old in all those years, organizes with other women especially to have at that point, in my opinion, the largest marches in the 20th century. Um, so again, we're talking about eight to 10,000 women strong with the men around, but it was woman led and they were out there and they got arrested and they were again struggling for pay or they were getting paid six or seven cents a pound and then it was reduced to like four and five cents a pound and they could actually have gone the factory, the, it was already mech, uh, huh? mechanized. mechanized, but it was cheaper to get the women's labor rather than using and buying all the machinery. So the women demonstrated, marched, and we also have Maury Maverick in this moment also supporting her voice and the voice of all these labor activists. And you know, he doesn't go down in history as a good guy because he's supporting these red and the communists. We're going to keep on moving just again. If you've spoken once, we're going to let other people speak first. So Pat, we're good. Uh, we've already heard your voice. Um, and we've already heard your voice. So we're going to wait a little bit. I thought, I'm sorry. I introduced myself. OK, I'm sorry. I, I'm okay. just sitting here quietly. Oh, no, OK, okay. I'm sorry. I, I thought you had. I mean, so that I wanted to add something to it. That was actually the seed that's pecan shell strike. It led to uh, hearings on the minimum wage, starting here. California and they started charging for entrance into the mission to try to protect it because it had dilapidated and the church also so they worked together and that's where 
Uh, so the, then the Conservation Society uh, needed money. They owned a granary at the time, and the part between the granary and the cut through to the mill, and they started it to restore the missions, and the church included. And then they moved it down to, uh, in 48 down to La Villita, uh, to make money for all of the historic preservation in San Antonio. Um, someone else inquired the year that um, their father built their house on 510 Elgin Street in 1942. Yeah. Elvira Street? Elvira. Okay. Um, oh, and also, the use of the Gulf Street developers stopped from the Destroying San Jose Mission Walls. Right. Roosevelt was supposed to go right next to the church. It would have taken all the walls out that everybody's so happy about right now. And uh, that was developers who came in, including Zachary, et cetera, and they stopped them uh, from doing that. And now Roosevelt, as you know, goes straight parallel. Uh, uh, Got it. Cool. Um, and then there's another the exclusion of people of color from primaries in the 90s, late, late 1940s. Can you explain that? They were, that's the first time it, it was declared unconstitutional prior to that. All of the primaries were white only, so there were never any candidates of color. Prior to when? Prior to when? Prior to around 1949. Big families was the one around Hemisphere, and those were Polish poor. 
So all of those were systematically raised one after the other. And a lot of these, uh, I, I mean, if you go by the Immaculate Heart of Mary um, neighborhood, there's nothing there. It's like still, you can you could, you could hear a pin drop except for the highway. And it's because they destroyed the, the, the economy there, the, the neighborhood was thriving and there were, um, uh, my mother says there, well, there was a sanitary Bavia factory, which was, by the way, the first mechanized Bavia factory in the country. Um, they had cleaners, they had a, a hospital, a women's hospital, they had, in fact, there were so many women dying in childbirth that they instituted an orphanage there. I mean, there were just things going on in the community that were very vibrant and contributing to the community, the city built those. And from there on, it hasn't stopped. So now they call it economic development. They call it urban renewal. Like I say, it was illegal in Texas. Also, I just, right now, I just want to raise hands because I know there's some folks that here may have either been uh, younger or maybe their families were displaced because of urban renewal. Any, any of it. So if anyone was displaced or had their families, okay, so there's something else. Thank you. Um, so 1953, there's a drought in Texas. It moves people from farms to inside, right? Center, is that correct? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, then we're moving 1960s. Um, I-35 built splitting the south side from the west side of San Antonio. Um, we also put MLK here, Martin Luther King Jr., that movement, civil rights movement. 1963, Kennedy was assassinated. 1966. Yeah. Yes, sure. So as a young child, I remember a prize. Uh, and, uh, my family had the portrait, of course, of the president and his wife. And uh, I don't remember this something to, to us as a dem Democrats, at least for them. Um, and, and it, I, I tried to write something for something, but like, the thing that stood out in my mind was Kennedy being assassinated and then being able to see it afterwards and how it affected at least uh, the family. Thank you. Um, so we put 1966 farm workers strike, march to Austin, start of, sorry, do, which I said, start of the Chicano movement. Chicano. Should I speak to that? Oh, sure. Um, I'm not saying that, that, that nothing happened before 66, but I think the Chicanos and I was one of them were kind of asleep. And so after the Farm workers strike in March that came through San Antonio um, in '66 and went on to Austin. Governor Conley just pissed us all off because uh, he wouldn't meet with the farm workers. After, after they had walked almost 500 miles, he met him in New Braunfels and he said, Don't bother going to Austin because I'm going to be there. And so he just pissed everybody off. And when they got to Austin, there were 10,000 people there waiting for them and finished the march. After '66, you had the Russell Youth Forum, you the Boy the Boynas uh, showed up. There's all kinds of groups and organizations that started after 1966. Bilingual Ed, Bill was a lot of things, and I'm not saying we did everything, but it kind of sparked people's attention about where the Chicanos were on the issues that were affecting us. And by the way, all of you have a flyer. We're going to have a 50th anniversary celebration here on Labor Day. Uh, for that, it's 50 years since the farm workers march. There's a few surviving farm workers. God bless their souls. Yes. They walked, they struck, they had nothing going for them. In 66, there were no food stamps, there was nothing, and they took the risk that they lost their jobs with their employers by going on strike. And then when nobody was listening to them, they said, let's march and let's get people in this state of Texas to know what's going on down here on the border.